it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is the home of online learning for double bass players. Um, and I'm really excited today to welcome a brand new tutor to the website. It's somebody who's a specialist in early music um, and has been joining us to present a course all about Baroque double bass. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Heather miller -Larden. Welcome, Heather. Thanks, Jeff. It's nice to be here. Well, it's been an absolute joy for me to hear you play. And we had, um, also, we had an ensemble in with you. We had harpsichord and Baroque cello. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to learn more about who you are and introduce you to the wider audience and maybe have a bit of a discussion about Baroque double bass and how the instruments are different and maybe one or two things about the approach. But first of all, let us know a little bit about what you're doing now and your specialities uh, in music. Well, uh, I mostly perform on period instruments, still a little bit of modern. Yeah. I teach at Temple University and I direct the early music ensemble there. Wow. That involves a lot of different instruments like recorder and lute, not all of which I play particularly competently, <laughs> but we can always talk about music. Yes. And I teach a private studio at home. And really early music is your great joy, would that be fair to say? Absolutely. And we were thrilled that you came in to talk to us about Baroque double bass. And well, let's get started by looking at, these are your two instruments that you brought with you. And we have this beautiful modern, uh, well, modern. It's, uh, where, when's this double bass from? What's the history of this instrument? Probably 1940s. We yeah. don't know exactly what it is. And I think it's some kind of beautiful French. We think maybe Spanish, maybe French. Could be. It's certainly an absolutely lovely instrument. Um, wonderful. I love these, mach these machines and the, the way that you can peek through this, the, the scroll there. <laughs> Easier to change strings too. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a bit of weight out. And it's, yeah, it's an absolutely lovely instrument. But what you have in your hands is really something quite different. So who's the maker? Tell us a little bit about the bass that you have and why you have it. This instrument was made by Tom Wolfe in Virginia, and it is a copy of an instrument from the 17th century, uh, an Italian instrument by Magini. So the logic behind using a new instrument is that when we're playing old music, is that it gives you the idea of what the instruments might have been like when they were new. Yes. Because at some point they were. They were not 300 years old then. And I'm guessing uh, it's harder to come by a Magini as well. It to, is uh, harder and more expensive. Have you ever had a chance to play on, a, maybe not a Magini, but on a, a really old Amati or some, some kind of really old double bass? Have I've ever, played on some of them. Yeah. It's a treat. Yeah. Uh, but this one is a, is, a, is a modern copy of an older instrument. Yes. And so you have this... What, what's the difference then between a, a, a modern double bass that we conventionally think of and the Baroque instrument? A lot of them are aesthetic, but the more structural things are the bass bar is lighter, okay. which you can't see, but that's how it's constructed. Mm. And the neck angle needs to be on a Baroque instrument would be a less steep. So I see. it puts less tension on the instrument. Yes. Those are, I think those two are the most important things. You have a, a gut, tail gut rather than steel. Yes. You might have more ornate figuration. Um, it doesn't matter whether the, the corners are gamba corners or violin corners and whether you have a round back as this instrument does or a flat back like that one does. Yes. It's generally the instrument's aesthetic. And, yeah, and often the uh, early instruments seem to have these, uh, I don't know, I'm guessing that's some kind of figured maple from yeah, maple. the board as opposed to an ebony one. Um, and also you have a, uh, is it a maple nut I'm guessing as well at that's the top right. there, which is different. So it certainly has that different aesthetic and it's very elegant uh, uh, looking and sounding instrument. And of course, the big difference between the two bases is the, or another big difference, is the string choice. Um, tell us a little bit about what you have on here. Uh, these look like beautiful gut strings. Yes, I have. Th my top three strings are pure raw gut. These are very highly twisted pieces of gut. They're not even just, they're, they have to be really um, put together from long, longer strands of sheep gut or beef gut or goat gut, which I believe mm. is what these are. And for the lower strings, many bass players will use the bottom two strings with a gut core wound over with silver or sometimes copper. I prefer the unwound A string. I see. But so there's, either one works. And who made this set? This set is by a company called Pure Chord, and they're based in Germany. Wow. Well, we were discussing them earlier. I mean, they're quite a, quite a, a, a beautiful sound, and it's very different. Could we hear just a couple of notes, maybe a scale or something, just to hear how this sounds? I think I can do that. Yeah. I can hear the E string. 
and they have such a different kind of sound compared to, I'm just going to play yours with a German grit, please excuse me, but... This, the gut strings have this raspier kind of quality to them, don't they? We call that chiff. Chiff. We, we call it that a sounds, good thing. Sounds very sophisticated. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's not a technical term. Yeah. It's but this, these strings have a really bright and resonant sound. Yeah. And the steel strings are darker and maybe more powerful. And and, and do you? What are the kind of common challenges of playing a, a set of, of gut strings? If I was to play your bass for the first time, which I actually did a, a couple of days ago, I had a played a few notes and it certainly was a different experience. What are the kind of issues that uh, modern in uh, pl players who are experienced with modern instruments uh, find when they transition across to a uh, Baroque double bass? You have to prepare every note. You, you have a lot more tension, um, excuse me, less tension yes. on these strings. So if you don't have it set up just right, they're going to squawk on you. So you're really kind of holding the string and releasing the tension. Yeah, you relax, put your weight in and relax. I mean, it's not any different than steel strings. It's sure. just you have to do it to a slightly different extreme. There's a certainly more care required. Yeah. And, and of course, um, your bow is very different in the sense that we don't have the, the camber, so the, the weight is distributed differently throughout the bow. Um, and then do, do you, you talk a little bit about the core, in the course about where you play on the bow as opposed to... Um, when you when you play a, mo a modern bow, maybe you could just touch a little bit about that and how you adapt to that <clears throat> bow. Yes, that's a that's a really good question. So with with the modern bow, because it's it can be very easily it's designed to be played evenly throughout. Yeah. We tend to do a lot of work to be able to play the same in every part of the bow, yes. and that is not entirely different from the baroque bow. But because this is designed to be lighter at the tip, that's an advantage that we have and can, take, can make use of. So one of the things that I touch upon in the course is how do you make a bow that is designed to be played evenly sound like one that is not designed to play evenly? Yes. And I think the good news is because double bass playing is at such a high level right now, we can do anything that we want. Yes. We just have to remember that we can take the weight out. It's a, it's a, it's a really incredible thing. It's a very different um, kind of a world of sounds and how about the tuning of the instruments obviously you know we all know how the modern double bass is, is typically tuned but how about early period instruments and what tuning are you using today well there are a lot of options and I don't even think today double bass tunings are entirely standard because some people will change them around well, yes it's not any different than it was two three hundred years ago uh, you had the most common one by the 18th century was certainly the tuning that we still use, the GDAE fourths tuning. Yes. Uh, you had some people using three strings and they would either tune them in fifths, A, can I, can I do the alphabet? A G, D, A, or they would tune them in fourths, just an A, D, G, and that takes a lot of tension off of an instrument that only has three strings. It's, yes. a, it's a fun thing to experiment with. Um, if you had six strings, a violone might be tuned from G to G, like a guitar with a third in the middle, or from A to A, or the really lowest ones would be from D to D. Wow. And those were, were functional in a slightly different way than each other. They were used for different things and they fell out of favor. It's incredible. That, that it's so interesting with the history of the double bass and the fact that everything is so different and non-standard. And as you say, even with modern instruments, people play all sorts of tunings, don't they? And it's a uh, it's a great thing for us. And just lastly, what about these frets? Um, how how uh, easy are they to install? And is, is that just regular, a regular string that you've wrapped around? How have you done this? Yes, these are, these are strings that are, uh, they're called fret gut. They are just not quite as high quality gut as has been made into these strings. Yes. And I tie them on with a knot and they just slide down the neck till they are taut. And if I want to change where they are because I'm playing in a different temperament or I don't think they're quite in tune with everybody else, then I can just move them. Yeah. It's, I, I, do you find you're doing it every concert or is it they're pretty much where they are and you just the odd little tweak? Is they it? are mostly where they are and I just kind of yeah. shove one here and there. Dep sometimes it depends on the key that I'm playing in. If I want something mm. to to sound a little lower for a lower third somewhere, I might do that. Yeah, well, I really loved hearing you and uh, the wonderful Baroque uh, cellist that we had with us, Sarah. But what's Sarah's full name? Sarah Freiburg. Oh, well, you just, you guys sound absolutely wonderful hearing you play uh, together yesterday. So if you're okay, Heather, we might wrap up the conversation and cut to a short um, 
a snippet of the, one of the performances that you did. So we can maybe give people a bit of an idea about what these wonderful instruments sound like in, in practice. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us this week, hearing you present all of these wonderful lessons on uh, Baroque double bass playing, Baroque, Baroque, uh, early music. It's been a real uh, joy. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you.